what can we know about the historical Jesus? How trustworthy are the Gospels, and what are we supposed to do with the miracle claims that the Gospels record? Today on the show, I bring on Dr. Craig Keener, who has a Ph.D. from Duke University in New Testament Studies. He is the uh, professor of New Testament at uh, Asbury Theological Seminary. He's well known for his work on the historical Jesus, as well as his background to the New Testament and uh, his uh, giant book about uh, the credibility of the miracles recorded in the in the Gospels, and I was very excited to have him on. He's a well-requested uh, speaker, and so I'm, I'm very happy to have interviewed him. We had a, a great conversation. He's a very nice man, and uh, I was very happy to meet him. Um, you have to um, pardon him. He was a bit uh, sick during the interview. He was uh, just getting over the flu. And uh, but it was still a great conversation, and it didn't really interrupt things at all. So I hope you enjoy the episode. If you do, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, leave us a review, and of course, if you want to watch the bonus segment and support Help Me Believe, you can do so by following the Patreon link in the description, labeled "Support Help Me Believe," and become a patron over there. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, guys, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Help Me Believe, the show about Christian apologetics and theology. My name is Hayden Clark, your host, and I am beyond excited to introduce my special guest to you. His name is Dr. Craig Keener. Dr. Keener, how are you doing today, sir? I am uh, recovering from uh, from flu, so if I have to cough a few times, it's it's for that reason. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, thanks so much uh, for joining me. I really oh. appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your day to do this, especially under uh, these circumstances. Uh, I greatly appreciate it, sir. Um, you are a very uh, well-requested uh, interviewee for me. i got a friend that is really excited that I'm interviewing you, and so I can't wait to put this out there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, again, I appreciate it. But uh, for the audience uh, members who may or, or may not be familiar with who you are, I thought it might uh, be helpful if you gave a brief introduction. Well, I'm Craig. I did my Ph.D. at Duke University in New Testament and Christian origins. I'm married to Medine. Uh, Medin is from Congo in Central Africa, which you probably can tell by looking at me. I'm I'm not from there, so we have a an intercultural marriage, and we learn a lot about each other's cultures, obviously, uh, all the time. Well, thank you for introducing yourself, and uh, I would love to hear your testimony and and how you became uh, a Christian in the first place. Thanks. I I wasn't raised in church. I mean, I knew I knew Christians. <clears throat> but I, yeah, I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Um, I had grandparents who were Christians. I had other relatives who were Christians. But by probably around the age of nine, I was an atheist. Um, certainly, I remember talking with my mom at that time and saying, I don't believe in life after death. And um, we had an interesting conversation at that point because I don't think she did either. And when I when I was about thirteen, to skip ahead a bit, I started reading Plato, and Plato got me thinking about life after death. Not that his arguments were all that persuasive, like the pre-existence of the soul. I was like, eh, I don't think that happened to me. Um, <clears throat> so. I wasn't persuaded by his arguments, but it really got me thinking about what life was really about. It was, if if it was just this finite segment, it seemed to be virtually meaningless in, in, in light of eternity. And I started thinking, <clears throat> you know, the only way that we could have an infinite life would be if we were plugged into something or somebody that was infinite that could guarantee that. And <clears throat> that would also have to be something that, even though it or he or she or whatever was infinite, cared about us. And why would it care about us? We were finite. And if it cared about us because because it was loving, well, 
I, I, I knew I wasn't loving. I, did, <laughs> I just wanted to keep existing. So I was, yeah, the Bible says that a person by um, striving with their intellect can't, can't find God that way. There was enough there to let me know that um, that would be this, you know, a God would be the solution if there was a solution, but I didn't, mm. I couldn't find God that way. But finally, even though I was an atheist, I started, I started saying, God, if you're out there, or a God or whatever, if you're out there, please show me. Yeah. But I didn't know if anything could happen. And <clears throat> one day, I ran into a couple Christians on the street who stopped me and began telling me about how I could have eternal life if I believed in Jesus, that he died for me and rose again. I argued with them for 45 minutes because, <laughs> I mean, they were showing me from the Bible and I'm like, I don't believe in the Bible. <clears throat> I'm an atheist. Can you give me anything, anything else to convince me? I mean, it wasn't like a hard-nosed atheist like... Well, I guess it was sort of was hard-nosed. I made fun of Christians. But I wasn't so hard-nosed that I wasn't willing to be persuaded if somebody could give me evidence. But they weren't giving me evidence. Well, I thought they weren't giving me evidence. So finally I said, if there's a God, how did the dinosaur bones get there? You ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. They say, oh, put them there. Well, ah. I said, okay, uh, you guys, I can't take this. I'm leaving. This is This is crazy. So I, I turned around to leave. Um, what they said to me at that point wasn't very pleasant. Uh, this is not the normal way that we recommend doing evangelism. But, you know, if, if they were led by the Spirit specifically, I don't know. But they, they didn't know paleontology. They didn't know too much about apologetics. But they were the only people in the street who were sharing their faith. I mean, I, I knew Christians who didn't share their faith with me. Right. And so some of them tried, actually. I shut them down. But anyway, so I'm, I'm walking home. I've studied different religions. I've made fun of, well, mainly I just made fun of Christians because it seemed like the dominant belief in the U.S., but it seemed to me like the Christians didn't really take it seriously. They, right. they didn't live like they believed God was their, their maker I was like, if I ever believed there was a God, I'd give God everything right. because that would be what I was made for. So, but as I was walking home, this was different from everything I'd studied, from the conversations I'd had. I felt God's presence, the presence of someone that I hadn't acknowledged. <laughs> and I got to, to my room and I was going back and forth in my heart, but finally I'm like, all right, God, I can't deny that you're right here in the room with me. This isn't something that is going to persuade other people who will say, well, this was just subjective. Right. But because I was in myself, I experienced this. So for me, it was like a reality. In any case, so I can't like communicate that necessarily by telling sure. somebody about it. Yeah. I, it was so real, just as real as, I mean, as real as anybody talking to me, God's presence was in the room with me. And he wasn't going to let me alone until I either accepted or rejected. And, you know, this is what I wanted if it was true. Mm -hmm. So... I said, God, I don't understand how Jesus dying for me and rising from the dead can save me. But if that's what you say, I'll believe it. But God, I don't know how to be saved. So if you want to save me, you're going to have to do it yourself. And all of a sudden, I felt something rushing through my body like I'd never felt before. I jumped up. Just I had no idea what was happening to me except, well... I decided I'd always said if I ever found out there was a God, I was going to serve him. So now I found out and now I was going to serve him. But I must tell you, little kids in Sunday school, I, I, I ended up going to a nearby church that, that Sunday. 
um, didn't know when the service started, got there too early, then came back, was too late. Oh, not too late to get there, but I was walking right. in after it started. Yeah. But the little kids in Sunday school, they knew more about the Bible than I did. I didn't know anything. And so I had to really start cramming to catch up. And if you read 40 chapters of the Bible a day, you can get through the New Testament every week or through the Bible every month. And that was, yeah, I did, I did that for some time, uh, trying to, trying to catch up. That's really neat. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing. Um, so I want to look at uh, uh, some of your work. Uh, um, first of all, with respect to the Gospels and the history of Jesus and that sort of stuff, what genre do you, would you say best fits the Gospels and why? Well, among the genres that existed in the first century, the one that fits the Gospels best is ancient biography, because that's the only genre that was about a specific individual, a historical individual. You know, you had other narrative genres. You had history, which, of course, could cover a lot of events and a lot of individuals. You had novels, though they weren't as common, but they were normally about fictitious characters, although there were exceptions to that. And they were normally romances, which is a feature that most of us find lacking in the Gospels. Right. So um, the the one kind of narrative work that was about a specific historical character was biography. Now, there were a range of different kinds of biographies. And so saying it's biography doesn't resolve everything about you know right. what to look for, but it, it's the closest fit we've got. Yeah. What are some of the uh, other biographies that the Gospels um, have similarities with, and, and maybe what are some of those similarities? Well, the, the earliest biographies, uh, we might even call them proto-biographies, were more like defending figures or sometimes attacking figures. Mm -hmm. um, Isocrates in his biography of Euagoras or Xenophon in his biography of Agesilaus or uh, sort of in his memorabilia where he presents Socrates as a teacher. I think that one's relevant. But these were very, <clears throat> very much focused on praise and blame. And they were not always as historically focused as they came to be in the later period. Um, <clears throat> in late antiquity, this is a few centuries after the Gospels, you have uh, lives of saints whether Christian saints or um, pagan philosophers, so-called saints, um, that were what we call hagiography. I mean, they, they, they took a lot more liberties. But the period in which the Gospels were written was the period in which, now you can classify biographies in different ways, but if you're looking for the question of their historical rootage, their grounding in historical information, uh, that's the, the the gospels are written in that period that in, in which biographies were most historically grounded so the period of say cornelius nepos the end of the roman republic until early third century diogenes laertius um, <clears throat> so in between that you have a, a number of biographies that have survived some of the most relevant would be a couple of first century Jewish biographies. One is Philo's Life of Moses. Mm -hmm. Another is Josephus's autobiography. And then early second century, you have Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars. This is Agricola. You have Plutarch writing a lot of biographies. <clears throat> uh, mid second century. <coughs> You have uh, Lucian's Demonax, which is a biography of a of a teacher, a philosopher. And then uh, I mentioned Diogenes Laertius in the early 3rd century, very meticulous documenting where he got his, his material. Some of it is, you know, about people who lived hundreds of years earlier, and, and his sources may not be as accurate, but he's, he's very, he follows his sources very closely. And he, again, is writing biographies of sages 
like Lukian did. And we know that that genre went back quite a way. So for Jesus as a teacher, those provide some, some helpful analogies. Does the genre in which you're classifying the Gospels, does it have any implication for how accurate the Gospel writers would have tried to have been in their telling of the story of Jesus? Sure. Um, the, the purpose of biography, writing in that genre, rather than, say, uh, composing a speech or composing a, a, a eulogy or something like that, if you're, if you're writing a biography— especially in this period of the early Roman Empire, you are trying to communicate, you, you, you want to communicate moral lessons, that's true, but you want to communicate them by means of facts. And various ancient writers talked about that as standard requirement for biography and history. I mean, as far back as Aristotle, it wasn't just bi biographers or historians who talked about this. It was it was other people commenting on what biographers and historians were supposed to do. Aristotle says <clears throat> the the difference between, say, epic poetry like the Iliad and history is history has to be based on fact, and you have uh, writers in the in the um, early Roman Empire like Pliny the Younger, who's an orator. He's a statesman. But he is also saying that about histor historiography, it has to be based on fact, it has to be based on information. So Lucian, again, says that in his, on how to write history, he says that both about history and biography, it needs to be, it needs to be, to communicate something, to give moral lessons, political or other kinds of ideological lessons, but it needs to do so based on facts. So you'd have different people writing biographies from different perspectives, sometimes opposing perspectives, trying to communicate different kinds of agendas, and yet they're depending on the same database, you know, the mm. same same array of information. Okay. Well, then the next question is, even if they believed that they were writing history or that the the genre the gospels belong to the genre of historical biography, how can we trust that their portrayal of Jesus is actually true or actually accurate? Um, some people might say, aren't these just claims uh, by people who lived a long time ago? How could we trust that they're accurate or true? Well, it may be true that the people lived a long time ago, but the question is, whether the, those who were writing about them lived a long time after the people about whom they were writing. So, you know, if, I, if I'm if i writing something now about Abraham Lincoln, I'm writing a long time after Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. But if my sources were written by Abraham Lincoln's contemporaries, well, then I've got a whole bunch of information from right around that time to work with. Alexander the Great probably our best surviving source about him, not our earliest source, but one of our earlier sources. Um, our best surviving source about him is Arian's work, uh, A-R-R-I-A-N. He wrote a, a five-volume uh, historical monograph about Alexander the Great. Now, he's writing in the second century, uh, Plutarch wrote about Alexander earlier in the second century. Uh, Quintus Curtius Rufus wrote about him in the first century, but um, but Arian has the the most material. Arian's writing about him in the second century A.D. Alexander the Great died in 323 B.C. So we're talking about a, a period of time over 400 years. Mm -hmm. The usual critical dating of the Gospel of Mark is more like 40 years, so like one-tenth of that length of time. When we're dealing with the Gospels, we're not even dealing, if, if we want to use the language of oral historiography, we're not dealing even with oral tradition. Oral tradition is normally considered the period after oral history. Oral history is pretty much like the period of what we also call living memory. That is the period in which people who still could have known the eyewitnesses were alive. It's usually after that period that we start having more significant changes 
to the stories. So all four of our first century Gospels are, and this is tautological, but our first century. That is, all four of them are from within living memory of Jesus' public ministry. Now, that's not that common for ancient biographies. You do have some. Um, Suetonius' biographies of the 12 Caesars go back maybe 150 years, but you know the more recent ones, he's writing about, um, well, one of the, one of the uh, biographies he writes, his father was um, an officer in that uh, emperor's army. Mm. So some of those things are within living memory. The Gospels are among the few works within living memory. There's very few figures in antiquity where we actually have four surviving works about the person from within living memory. So, yeah, I'd say we're on pretty good grounds historically when we're looking at the Gospels. Sure, sure. So, uh, would the I can I can hear a skeptical person saying four decades is a long time. Would the Gospel writers? Uh, sources, these original eyewitnesses, have, uh, would they have really remembered the events for decades uh, until the gospel writers had a chance to write them down? Well, by, by ancient standards, four decades, as I, as I mentioned, wasn't a, a very long time. But even if we're thinking about it today, I mean, um, some of your listeners, like me, may have been around 40 years ago. But for those who weren't, they probably know somebody who was around 40 years ago. I mean, if like our parents got married 55 years ago and they tell us, you know, we got married 55 years ago and we say, well, uh, we really need to see the documentation for that, the wedding certificate and so on, because we don't really believe you could remember something like that for 55 years, parents or grandparents or whoever. I mean, we wouldn't take that seriously today. Because we recognize that, yeah, we forget most things, but things that are very significant to us, we can remember for a very long time. In terms of things that are significant to us or seem very significant to us now, after five years, we'll only remember about half of those, even even the things we consider significant. But the forgetting curve decreases after those five years because the things go into long-term memory. So a lot of those things we'll still remember 50 years later. Robert McIver, uh, an Australian scholar, has done a whole lot of work on this with in terms of psychological memory and, and so on. And I did some experiments of my own. Just uh, I'm 59 at the time of this recording. And, and when I, a few years ago, I said, let, let me try to think. There was this road trip that our family took when I was seven years old. We didn't have that many road trips, so it was memorable to me and not confused with other road trips. So I thought of the things that I could remember from that that length of time ago, and then I uh, asked my mom what she still remembered of that road trip. And obviously, we didn't all remember the same things. You know, I, I remembered about 25 bits of information from it, she remembered information from it. Uh, I was able to confirm some things, and there were other things she didn't remember. But there were some things we both remembered clearly right right off the bat. I mean, if I asked her what happened on the road trip, one of the things was that I, I got a tick in my belly button uh, hiking in the, in the hills of North Carolina. And I didn't see what the problem was. They pulled off the other ticks, but that one, they, they took some alcohol, put it on there, and after it released its grip, then they, they pulled it out. And my mom and I both remembered that one because that was more significant to us. So, uh, or I hope I'm not boring you with these stories. No, these old please stories. continue. <laughs> there, was, <clears throat> there was another, I, I went to my 40th high school reunion last year and one of my classmates who graduated with me from high school was remembering an incident from when we were both in I think it was third grade she remembers the grade uh, but I remember the incident because I was embarrassed she remembered the incident because she thought it was entertaining <laughs> where I was I was um, 
I, I was humming a popular TV show's theme song, Gilligan's Island theme song. It's a good show. And, yeah. and, and, and anyway, the teacher said, ah, you're gonna, if you're going to hum that song, then you have to sing it to the whole class. So I did. And, <laughs> and Cindy was so impressed. She said, you got every word right. Well, that's from like 50, uh, about 50 years ago. No, things from about 40 years ago, I remember them a lot better because things when I was in elementary school, my, yeah. I just, my memory wasn't that good yet. But yeah. from my, my late teens, uh, that's, that's often the, the period of our strongest memory, late teens, early 20s. And interestingly enough, that was also the most common age for disciples in antiquity. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, and in terms of the emphasis on memory in antiquity as opposed to today, am I, am I taking too long on this one? No, please continue, yes. All right. All right. You're good. Um, so the, the emphasis on memory in antiquity. Now, I'm going to give you an extreme example because it's funny sure. and it's memorable, but it's not it's not normal. So this is an extreme example. But there was a an orator by the name of Seneca, uh, not not to be confused with his famous son, the philosopher Seneca, but this orator Seneca, he, he, he writes a book, he says, you know, when I was young, I had a really good memory. You could give me 2,000 names, and I could repeat them back in exactly the succession in which I, I heard them. You could, you could give me 200 lines of verse, and I could repeat them back in reverse order. And, he, and of course, there were other people who had some remarkable things, but he's one of the most remarkable. He's like these very, very exceptional people you read about today who memorize phone books, which I find a rather useless use of memory. But anyway, just just showing off. But uh, he he says, you know, when I was young, I could do that. But now that I'm old, I will just uh, share with you some of the practice speeches that my fellow students gave in oratory school. And a lot of these were now famous orators, so everybody was interested. And he gives from memory bits of something like a hundred of these practice speeches from oratorical school. Now, I have had speech classes. I think I only remember one of my own speeches, Mm -hmm. and, and not the whole speech, just what the subject was. But Memory was very important in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, it was very important in, in a variety of ways, and it, not just for educated people. You had illiterate bards who could repeat all the Homeric epics pretty much from memory. You had uh, orators. One of the basic tasks of oratory was to be able to repeat back your speech from memory. And... Uh, perhaps most relevant to the Gospels, you had disciples, students of teachers. From the elementary level up, one of the most conventional features, standard features of ancient education was memory. They'd memorize the sayings of teachers, famous teachers, and so on. By the time you got to more advanced levels of education, you would, as a disciple in your in your teens, you would memorize if you're an orator, you'd, you'd memorize practice speeches. If you were in a philosophic school or Jewish school learning the Torah, you would you would recite uh, what you were learning there. And you were supposed to be able to pass on the teachings of the school of which you were a part. So that was the standard expectation. Some people say, well, the, the Jesus disciples, they would be different. They would be illiterate. It doesn't matter because a lot of the learning was purely oral, mm-hmm. not just. And uh, th- there, there are reasons to question whether all the disciples would have been illiterate. But right. uh, even even if they were, I mean, you've got people today who are illiterate, who don't understand Arabic, who can recite the entire Quran from memory. So, the human memory can be trained to do remarkable things. And in terms of Jesus' disciples, 
their job as disciples. I mean, pretty much everybody agrees Jesus was a teacher. He had disciples. Their job as disciples would be to remember and communicate his teachings. So we have every reason to believe that the teachings would have been preserved. Also, uh, in terms of the behavior, <coughs> trying to remember what, sorry, the behavior, trying to remember what, <clears throat> what the teacher did, that was sometimes used, say, for example, later rabbis used it as legal precedent, <laughs> how their rabbis or the rabbis of their rabbis had behaved, because, you know, that was, that was considered relevant to what you can learn about um, proper behavior. So how would you advise someone who wants to study more about the historical Jesus or the uh, historical nature of the Gospels, that sort of stuff? Uh, what what books would you recommend and, and all that? It depends on what you're looking for. Um, if you're looking for the more mainstream scholarly works, you'd be looking at, at scholars like E.P. Sanders, uh, John Meyer, Gert Tyson, uh, T H E I S S E N, uh, Geza Vermish, I would include him there. Now, um, yeah, when, when I say mainstream, they're, they're kind of centrist. They're not conservative scholars, they're not liberal scholars, they're, uh, and, and they, they don't agree with each other in everything. Uh, actually, they disagree with each other in a lot of points, but, and their methodologies are, are different too, but they are representatives of probably what we would call the mainstream. Uh, N.T. Wright would be, uh, no pun intended, somewhat to the right of that, but but still, I think, widely respected. Uh, I also would be to the right of that, as, as you can imagine. Uh, Daryl Bach and a, a number of uh, a number of other scholars uh, fit that, you know, the more evangelical wing of Jesus scholarship. Uh, of course, on the left end of Jesus scholarship, you've got the Jesus Seminar, and then, well, I won't even talk about the ones who go <laughs> way far out on the edges, but uh, yeah, um, Bart Ehrman I would place on the on the left, but he's he's still within ma mainstream Jesus scholarship. So in terms of um, those who are publishing within the within the discussion of Jesus scholarship, you have a range of views. If you want those who are um, have a high view of the, the you know the the reliability of the Gospels. Uh, you have myself, Craig Evans, Craig Blomberg, a lot of Craigs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Daryl Bach, Mark Strauss. Uh, there's there's a good good number of us. Uh, I'm, I'm Ben, ben Witherington. Uh, I'm 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 leaving I'm leaving out the names of friends. I'm just I'm doing this off the top of my head. So. No, you're fine. No worries. <laughs> Well, I want to move on uh, to discuss uh, your work on miracles, but first, uh, for the audience, I do want to say uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, after this, if you want to watch the five more minute bonus segment with Dr. Craig Keener, just follow the Patreon link in the description below and become a supporter of Help Me Believe to uh, view that. Um, but uh, Dr. Keener, uh, excuse me, Dr. Keener, uh, you've also written on the miracles that are recorded in the Gospels and their credibility. So, uh, how can we go about? Um, discovering whether or not that the the, God, the miracles in the Gospels are credible or not credible. Yeah, I'm glad you used the word credible because there's some things, I mean, I think we have enough information to trust the witnesses, uh, to trust the, the testimony of the Gospels on this. But the objection to the miracle is often, well, the Gospels include miracles. We know miracles don't happen. Therefore, you can't trust these accounts, which seems to me to be kind of a circular argument. Yeah. Well, how do yeah. we know that miracles don't happen? Who, who proved that? And people will often, if you, if you push them back and they, they know something about the history of their argument, they'll say, well, that goes back to David Hume. David Hume, in a famous essay, argued that Miracles are violations of natural law. Natural law can't be violated. Therefore, 
miracles don't happen. Right. Uh, so that's the usual interpretation of the first half of his essay, which is just setting, it's just constructing the rhetoric of the argument so as to not have to make an argument. It's the kind of argument that Hume himself despised because Hume was an empiricist. He, he, he liked inductive stuff. Right. This is right. not an inductive argument. <clears throat> but Hume is getting a lot of this from the deists, uh, who they're actually the more radical deists. And that's why there are some holes in his argument, because there's certain things he's taking for granted from the deists. But be that as it may, defining miracles as violations of natural law doesn't actually fit most of the miracle accounts that we have wow. in the Bible. Yeah. I mean, when God blows back the the sea by means of a strong east wind in Exodus 14, that's not a violation of nature. That's right. making use of nature and, and so on. Uh, it was, Hume was being provocative probably by, by labeling it that way. But in terms of them being violations of natural law, first of all, He's got a prescriptive understanding of natural law that doesn't fit our contemporary understandings of natural law. Second, it didn't even fit the understanding of his day because you know, he's getting his idea of natural law from Newton and the Newtonians. Well, Newton and the Newtonians, they talked about natural law because they saw the, the order within nature. They believed God created that, that order. And they didn't believe that God was subject to that order. So God wasn't violating natural law to do something. If I, if I, if I hold up this, this water bottle and then I drop it, uh, and hopefully I don't drop it on my lap, not sealed at the top, that should be all right, but <laughs> drop it, if I catch it, have I violated natural law? Exactly. Have I simply acted within nature? If I can act within nature, what kind of God would we be talking about who couldn't act within nature? But in any case, maybe a deist God. But in any case, the second part of Hume's essay is, and it may be the basis for his first, uniform human experience gives us reason to doubt all miracle claims. Well, what about if you have credible eyewitnesses? Well, he says there aren't any. Yeah. And, and if you, if you have some that are like the claims seem to be strong enough, you can't ignore them. You can always dismiss them by saying, well, they violate uniform human experience. Again, a circular argument. So <clears throat> he cites an example of one that he knew about. It was, it was medically documented. It had uh, all sorts of evidence in support of it. Uh, public, many witnesses. He says, and we know this didn't happen, so why would we believe any other claim? What kind of <laughs> argument is that? Anyway, <clears throat> so once that idea became widespread, it, it affected a lot of disciplines, including New Testament studies. So, for example, you had David Friedrich Strauss in the 1800s saying, well, what you have in the Gospels are myths or legends. These, these miracles had to arise over the course of generations because eyewitnesses would never claim this. And yet Strauss should have known better because Strauss had a friend by the name of Edward Morica who was barely able to walk be because of a diagnosed spinal injury. And yet, after he spent some time with the German Lutheran pastor, Johann Christoph Blumhardt, who was known for a ministry of healing and exorcism in the, in the uh, 1800s, after he spent some time with him, Morica is hiking in the mountains, and Strauss knows this. And Strauss says, okay, that was just, he was, his diagnosed spinal problem was just psychosomatic. But he doesn't say that this account is merely a legend that took generations to arise. Bultmann, in the, in the 20th century, as a, as a critic, um, Rudolf Bultmann, he had had some good ideas, but he also had some what I think are not so good ideas. But Boltman said nobody in the modern world believes in miracles. Mm -hmm. He didn't even feel he needed to argue the case. And if somebody brought up the stories of Bloomhart, 
who was by then a generation or two earlier, he said, those are just legends. Okay, so he's consistent. The problem is that today we actually have Bloomhart's diaries, we have letters from eyewitnesses, all, all these things that historians have collected from Bloomhart's time. These weren't legends. His were firsthand accounts that were available of some rather dramatic healings, as well as, you know, some less dramatic ones. But, you know, a couple people, as far as anybody could tell, they were even raised from the dead. Um, so we're, we're talking about, can we start with the premise that uniform human experience excludes miracles? There was a 2006 Pew Forum survey in which when the, um, the survey is extrapolated in terms of estimates of hard numbers, you've got hundreds of millions of people around the world claiming to have witnessed divine healing. Now, how can you start with the uniform, the, the premise that uniform human experience excludes miracles when you've got hundreds of millions of people claiming it? Mm -hmm. Hume would not have done that, surely. Hume was a smart man. He wouldn't have done that. So I think today, those who want to say miracles don't happen need to come up with a different argument. You can say, okay, well, I don't believe these are divine activities. I'll just call them anomalies. But you can't deny that people have experiences and that people understand these as miracles. And pretty much the same range of experiences you have in the Gospels, I can provide you eyewitness testimony for those things today. And in the case of the healings, in, in many of these cases, I can, probably most of these cases, I can provide cases with medical documentation as well. So I think that's a good case for, like you said, uh, uniform human experience is not that miracles are impossible or don't happen. Uh, that makes perfect sense to me. I think, uh, I don't know, you, you cited a statistic there, but I would be willing to bet if I asked someone, have you experienced something miraculous, the odds are pretty good that they would say yes. Um, most people j just have had experiences that they cannot explain, at the very least an experience that they cannot explain. But th that's a big, that's a major step in making the case for the miracles in the gospel. But um, obviously I know you would agree just because miracles are possible doesn't mean that the miracles recorded in the Gospels actually happened. So yes. what, what, what else would you add to bolster the credibility of the New Testament accounts of miracles? Well, for that, again, I'd go back to the issue of the genre of the Gospels. So because the genre was that the, the writers are writing biographies, they're going to want to base their arguments and their uh, presentation on information that's available to them. And then the question ar arises, as we talked about earlier, well, how do we know that the information available to them was correct? Well, if you work from the inference of them writing within living memory, there's good reason to believe that this information is correct, especially when we're comparing them with other ancient sources that we will often routinely depend on for historical information, why why be more skeptical of the Gospels? Sure, um, I'm I'm not the the scholar, and I'm not familiar with all the ancient uh, literature, but I'm I believe that there are other biographies that record miraculous events outside of the Gospels around this time period. Is that correct? There are um, now most biographies that record miraculous events talk about events centuries earlier. So yeah. by by those standards, we may be dealing with legends, um, may, or, may or may not. You know, it's hard to say, depending on what those biographer sources were. <clears throat> but in the case of Tacitus and Suetonius, who are both very yeah. sober historians, both of them, uh, so we have independent attestation in that sense, although they may both be using the same source, but both of them report some miracles that... Um, accompanied the announcement of, of Vespasian going to be emperor. Now, how we explain those as Christians, there are various possible explanations, and one of them is that God 
did that because he wanted Vespasian to be emperor. Josephus certainly thought God wanted Vespasian to be emperor. Another is that, um, you know, I mean, all through the Bible you see that there are other superhuman um, spiritual powers besides God that are also at work in the world. So we also can appeal to that. And then, you know, there are the, the other explanations that people often give to typical miracle stories, unless you have enough of them or um, some of them particularly dramatic that can um, meet those objections. But anyway. Yeah. So w with respect to other religions and maybe there's, uh, and I mean, I don't know of any documented cases or anything you've studied a lot. So maybe, maybe you do know of one, or even if this is just a hypothetical, then perhaps, um, so imagine a, a prophet of a different religion, uh, say of Islam or something like that, who does something miraculous, but mm -hmm. like in the name of their God, um, and then it actually does happen, and, and the point of doing the the point of the prophet doing it would have been to uh, vindicate, you know, his belief in his God. What do you what do you do with something like that? Well, when you have competing miracle claims, <clears throat> competing miracles, the miracles don't necessarily resolve the issue. It doesn't rise or fall in the miracles. What the miracle claims of all religions, I think, do contrary to Hume's argument about this, um, insofar as we can we can document some of them, maybe any of them that are well documented, which most of them aren't, but any of them that are well documented could challenge the traditional Western anti-supernaturalistic approach. Now, when you have competing claims of different religions, actually they're not all competing because we believe God loves everybody and sometimes Somebody cries out to God. My my mother-in-law from Congo. Sure. She was, um, <clears throat> before she became a Christian, uh, before there were many Christians in her region in Congo, she was crossing a river on a log and she fell off. And she was going under the water when she felt a hand pluck her out and put her on the log. And she looked around and there was no one there. And she said, some spirit must have saved her. And later on, when she became a Christian, she knew who that was. Right. She knew that God saved her, but she didn't know at the time. So uh, I, I have a friend who uh, spent time among Palestinian Muslims who said that often they pray in the name of Isa, the prophet Isa, Jesus, because they, they get healed when they do that. <laughs> maybe, maybe God is saying something, you know? Uh, but... Also, we do have in the Bible, like Pharaoh's magicians in Exodus chapter 7 and 8, although God's power is shown to be greater than that, you also have a number of other examples, Acts 8, Simon Magus, Acts 13, Elymas Bargesus, you have uh, Acts 19, the seven sons of Sceva, you have Jesus' warning of false prophets with false signs and wonders in uh, Mark 13, 22, somewhere around there, um, Matthew 24, 24, Second uh, Thessalonians 2, a false prophet with signs and wonders, Revelation 13. So you can have signs and wonders that are from God, and you can also have signs and wonders that are not from God. Mm -hmm. and they're Discernment becomes important right. when you're uh, discussing that. Sure. Well, I don't want to, I hate to put you on the spot like this, but I just know what some of the uh, audience will be thinking whenever they hear you discussing this, or hopefully I, I have a good understanding of the audience. But um, so, like in the case of your uh, mother in law, and uh, she was divinely uh, rescued there in that moment. For every one of those instances, there's going to be a ton where the person was not rescued. And so some people might see this as uh, some sort of an objection. Um, how do you how do you respond to that? Well, I think with my mother-in-law, it's because God knew the future and knew what she would become. But in the case of, yeah, for all the all the times when miracles don't happen, we have, 
in the Gospels a promise of eschatological verification. That is, in the, in the end, God will vindicate his truth completely. He's often more subtle in the present. But the signs and wonders are meant to be a foretaste of that eschatological vindication. So in Matthew 11 and Luke 7, <clears throat> when John the Baptist sends to Jesus, he says, I've, I've, I've heard about the healings you're doing, but are you the one to come or should we look for somebody else? Because John was expecting somebody who was going to baptize in fire, and he didn't see any fire. And if the kingdom wasn't coming soon, John kind of wanted to know that. Jesus sends, John is in prison, and he's about to be executed. So um, Jesus sends back to John the messengers with this message. Tell John what you've heard and seen. And then he lists different different uh, expressions of the kingdom from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. And, and John should have caught the allusion to, to these passages. <clears throat> now, in context, these passages talk about the promised restoration of God's people and the restoration of creation, like the deserts would blossom with lilies and you know, ultimately there'll be a new heavens and a new earth and so on. So Jesus is saying to John, John, the, the consummation of the kingdom isn't here yet. It's like the kingdom is like a mustard seed. It's not come in all its fullness yet, but this is a foretaste of the kingdom. And he, he does the same thing with regard to casting out demons in Matthew 12:28 and Luke 11:20. Jesus says, if I, by the finger or the Spirit of God, am casting out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he's claiming that the kingdom is present in his ministry. I mean, it's, it's future, the consummations in the future, but there's a foretaste of the kingdom in the present. What that suggests to us is that, yeah, not, not everybody gets healed right now. But when it happens to any of us, it's a reminder to all of us of God's promise to us of a future time when he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. There's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more death. I'll be glad for my sinus infection to be gone. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's why instead of using the times when it doesn't happen to act like it never happens, we should look at the times when it does happen and say, okay, God is up to something and we need to take that into account. Although there is something deeper in the Gospels, I think, than miracles. Miracles are a beautiful sign of the future. But the cross shows us that even when, from our own human perspective, it looks like God is not at work, when God has forgotten us, when God is silent in the midst of injustice, God really is at work to bring about his purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got one more question for you about miracles before we go to the bonus segment. Again, to the audience, if you want to watch five more minutes with Dr. Craig Keener, just follow the Patreon link in the description below and become a supporter. Now, my final question is a bit more biblical, theological, uh, which is, and I know you don't um, – follow this line of thinking based on what you just said about uh, experiencing miracles and things like that but some people claim, uh, Christians that is that uh, this uh, sort of stuff ceased with the apostolic age, that is gifts of healing and things like that the miraculous um, I grew up in the Baptist church and not every Baptist believes this way but uh, you know, there's I, there were quite a few people who were saying, you know when the perfect comes, these things will end, or I, I can't remember the particular text. And e even as, uh, like, first time I heard this, far w well before I went to seminary and actually was studying the scriptures for myself, uh, my immediate thought was, uh, I, don't th I don't think that perfect there was talking about the Bible. <laughs> but uh, yeah. anyway, so how do you respond to uh, that sort of an idea? I remember the first time somebody was trying to persuade me of that. It was a really new convert to Christianity, and, and they were pointing that out to me in 1 Corinthians 13. So all these things will pass away when that which is perfect has come. And, and I just moved my finger down 
a little bit, and they said, yeah, but it says when we see him face to face, that hasn't happened yet. And so he started trying to explain how that had already happened, and it's like it, there just was no way. But in any case, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's a that's a rather weak argument. There's actually no place in the New Testament where it predicts that the gifts will cease, that prophecy will cease, certainly that miracles will cease. <clears throat> I think most people who say that prophecy has ceased will concede that God can do miracles Correct. when he wants. So, you know, God is sovereign. So I don't want to exaggerate anybody's position. <clears throat> Although there there have been times in history, <clears throat> some of the uh, some of the early Puritans, although miracles happened among them, some of them, they saw miracle claims as something Catholics did. And so uh, they said, no, 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 we, we don't, we don't believe in that. And yeah. so they, uh, sometimes somebody would get healed, somebody who hadn't been able to walk for years. And there'd be a, a scripture reading about the paralytic being healed. And as they heard the scripture being read, there in the midst of the church, they'd get up and start walking. And People didn't know what to do with it. They said, well, we can't call it a miracle. We'll call it a special providence. Right. So it was just a, another name for the same thing. But yeah. in any case, um, God is so sovereign, he can surprise us Christians too. In terms of whether those things have ceased, now, <clears throat> some of the church fathers did believe that they had diminished. Um, they, they, they had ceased compared to the way they were in an earlier period. Augustine held that view for a while, but then he he found out that miracles were happening. And so in his City of God 22.5, he, he starts talking about some of the miracles that he knew about. And he said that his diocese had collected like 70 affidavits already of dramatic miracles that had taken place in the previous two years since they'd actually started collecting these. They included things like healings of blindness and raisings from the dead. So not minor things, but right. uh, rather significant things. <clears throat> and <clears throat> through, through history, we have a number of claims. But because they were, they were getting really out of hand, it, uh, by, by the time Luther came along, I mean, Luther had a right to make fun of some of this. He, people were passing around fake relics and... I think that for some people, they, they became a contact point for their faith, and God God touched them because God knew the people's hearts. But um, <clears throat> but Luther joked that there were enough nails left from the Holy Cross to shoe every horse in Saxony. Yeah. That, you know, why why do we have 13 of the original 12 apostles buried here in Germany? And, and, and so, <clears throat> so there was a, a reaction against that, and that was understandable. What became more of a driving force? Because Luther Luther prayed for Melanchthon. Melanchthon got healed. I mean, there were. It's not like they didn't believe God would ever do anything like this. But uh, what what happened in the, you know when Hume comes along and makes his argument, and makes it intellectually fashionable to stop believing in miracles. Then people said, okay, no, we we have to still believe in the ones in the Bible, but now we just don't believe in miracles today. And so <clears throat> that became a really driving force in uh, the way some people approach cessationism. Now, in terms of the, the gift of prophecy, you have it at varying times and places throughout the Bible. You have no warning that it's going to disappear at some point. So it seems to me more biblical to believe that it would continue. But when you have prophecies, you also have the messy job of evaluating true prophecies and false prophecies, um, both within the local church. First Corinthians fourteen twenty nine talks about that, and you know, in the book of Jeremiah, you had Jeremiah was the only true prophet in this generation. The others were prophesying falsehood. Well, the other ones we know about. I'll just say that we're we're all prophesying falsehood. So. The Bible is much more secure because, you know, looking back, we know whose prophecy should make it into the Bible, not not right. the other guys. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the the main concern 
that many people have, I think, with prophecy continuing after the close of of the Bible, after the close of the canon, is that then we would have post-biblical revelation, right. our post-biblical doctrine. Mm-hmm. But we don't say that about the gift of teaching. I mean, teaching, you can have false teaching too. You can have post-biblical teaching too. In fact, the the doctrine that prophecy has ceased is really itself a post-biblical teaching. Precisely. It's, it's biblical doctrine. So it's epistemologically self-defeating to to use that argument against prophecy. In 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 the Bible, I mean, when you have the Bible being written, it can be written at the same time that prophecy is going on without prophecies going into the Bible. So, you know, you if in First Corinthians fourteen, if what Paul says about let two or three prophesy was even close to an average in the house churches in the first century. We've probably got like 400,000 prophecies being given in, in the first century house churches. You, you look in the Old Testament, in First Kings 18, it says that Obadiah hid 100 prophets by 50s in a cave when Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord. Well, both the prophets that she killed and the prophets that Obadiah hid, their prophecies aren't recorded in the Bible. If they were prophets, surely they prophesied. But just because something is the word of the Lord in that sense doesn't make it scripture. Scripture doesn't mean that's all that God has ever said. I mean, when God bears witness, when the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm God's child, that's God speaking in a sense. But scripture is not just God speaking. It's even more than just, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things God speaks, but when God's, what we have in scripture is, it's the canon, it's the measuring stick, it's the agreed upon minimum that we recognize as the standard for evaluating all other claims. Right, yeah, for and, sure. And actually, even post-biblical doctrines, so whether by prophecy or by teaching. Yeah, I think that I think that's I think you're exactly correct. I think I remember hearing uh, somebody say that uh, you know there's essentially no purpose in God uh, making a special revelation to somebody today um, because you're going to adjudicate whether that special revelation really was from God or not by uh, appealing to the scriptures. So why would God, uh, you know, do that if you already have the scriptures? Which so it, it, does that make sense? Uh, of course, I mean, I already, I mean, I, I was going to give my response to that, which is, well, I mean, it's a special revelation in the sense that, like Paul got whenever he was traveling and doing missionary work, and he wasn't allowed to go into wherever. I don't have as good a memory as you do, but the that, he, that he, he <laughs> sixteen, yeah, yeah, and then he, and then, uh, you know, he has a vision, he has a dream that, yeah. basically, the point of which was, no, you need to do mission work over here, and. That that's the point of special revelation is to be you know that or that's one explanation is that it's yeah. the purpose is to be more exact in your knowledge of what you're supposed to do that would be one explanation that's what he did with Paul Paul didn't need that to know that he was supposed to go preach the gospel he already right. was doing that he needed that yeah. to know that God wanted him there right now um, yes. so I mean I find these uh, objections I guess weak would be the <laughs> I don't want to be I, mean but. <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, I think that well, it's not. I mean, if somebody were saying something with doctrinal content, then we evaluate it by scripture. If something's saying uh, by, <clears throat> like, Craig Keener, you should stop teaching at this seminary. You should go teach at another seminary. Yeah. Then that that needs to be evaluated by my own hearing of the Holy Spirit and so on. And but by, by the way, I one of the reasons I'm here at Asbury is because. A dream that I have. Hmm. Do you want to tell us about that? <laughs> oh, if you want me to, sure. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't want to bore your audience by talking too long, but you can. Do, okay. I guess you can divide it up into segments if it's too long. So. Sure. I. I had a dream. Actually, I had. There was a school that was interested in me, and I was happy already where I was. So. I wasn't really thinking that much of going. I really didn't feel a piece about it, but I, I said I'd pray about it. 
uh, and they were offering me like thirty thousand dollars more a year than I was I was making, which I was able to live on what I had, but I would be able to give away a whole lot more if I made yeah. the other. So yeah. I, I I was praying praying about it, went to sleep. That night I dreamed that I asked my friend Ben Witherington for advice. And when I woke up in the morning, I said, that's a good idea. Let me ask Ben Witherington for advice. <laughs> so, I, so I just emailed him and he said, oh, we're about to have an opening here. You should come here. I'm like, okay. But that, I never I never even saw the opening posted because I wasn't right. looking. If, yeah. if it hadn't been for that dream, I wouldn't be at Asbury right now. Right, and a whole host of other things wouldn't have happened, I suppose. Yeah, maybe you wouldn't have had me on this podcast. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, who knows what the <laughs> ripple effect might have been? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, thanks so much for joining me, uh, Doctor Keener. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I'm very excited to have gotten the chance to talk to you, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this in general. But especially since you're under the weather and and have the flu and all of that, uh, if you're listening, be, be sure to be praying for uh, Doctor Keener as he is uh, a little bit sick, if 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 you couldn't tell. But uh, again, thanks uh, so much for joining me, sir. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Aiden. It's great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, leave us a review, and of course, if you want to watch the bonus segment, Five More Minutes with Dr. Craig Keener, just follow the Patreon link in the description below and become a supporter of the show. Thanks so much again, guys, and we'll see you next time.